So what we want to talk about, particularly on this call, is how do you use content and a content framework to produce one piece of content that moves them from prospect to, shit, we need to start taking action on this now, and how do you get those four agreements baked into your content to organically move them through the process so that they want to have a conversation with you? Because I promise you, if people reach out to you and want to have a conversation with you, you're like eight and a half times more likely to close them into a client than if you interrupt them and and get in front of them and start to try and convince them that they should become a client. You want them coming to you. And the way that you do that is through content, right? So how do you use content to present your offer and get those four agreements? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're about to dive into for the rest of this episode of the Agency Hour. Welcome to another episode of the Agency Hour live here in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. And uh, now from rock and roll to something a little smoother, I'm going to introduce you to my good friend and co-host of the Agency Hour, Pete Crispy Butter Perry. Yes, welcome, I will brother. Never get old. <laughs> I wish the people uh, on the podcast could see the see Max's well, little work there. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that. I was just thinking that that's that's great. Uh, it's great vision for radio, isn't it? If you yeah. if you are listening to this as a podcast, you should definitely come and join the Digital Mavericks Facebook group just to watch the first two minutes of this episode in the group. But that's right, we live stream this podcast in the group, so there's video that goes along with this podcast. And Pete has his own little animated bumper that comes up and. Uh, introduces him maybe max could add a voiceover to that little bumper oh, God. <laughs> or, or or we could do the voice of god pete crispy butter perry so when we play that little bumper uh, people that listen we, to the podcast know what it's about we have a recording somewhere of me doing some karaoke we can try. oh dear wow <laughs> wow Which, that's by the vault. way was five years ago last week is uh, that ruptured, right ruptured my achilles doing karaoke Miami. So the mastermind we ran out in Miami was five years ago. March 23rd, 2017. A day that I will never right. forget. Wow. That's, and, and that's before we had Oscar. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, right. So welcome. For those of you who are watching, let us know what country you are from in the comments. Uh, Thomas Condi is here. I think that's how I say your name. Thomas Condi. Look at that. There's another bumper. Yeah, Where in the world are you? Yeah, he's on it. Max has just got too much time in his hands, hasn't he? Today, there's been a lot of chatter in the Facebook group recently. And one of the things, uh, there's a whole other conversation that we should have at some point around productizing your services. There's a post that's kind of going nuts in the in the group at the moment, getting a lot of good conversation. And we will do some training around that. And we will do a uh, an episode of the Agency Hour around productizing your services. But one of the most common conversations that we have, one of the most common questions that we get on support tickets, on uh, email, Facebook Messenger, uh, one of the most common conversations we have is from small agencies and freelancers saying, I need more clients, right? And Damien, who works in our sales team, Pete in coaching, myself here, Emily, we talk all the time about what it means to get clients. How do you get clients? And so I just want to recap something I spoke about on a call earlier this week with one of our sales accelerator clients, Peter Wright. We were talking, hello, Peter, if you're watching, we were talking about, um, you know, getting, he works a lot on referrals and word of mouth and does very well, but he doesn't want to just rely on referrals. He wants to be able to be more proactive in generating leads from other channels. And he said, well, so I don't know if I should do this or do this or do SEO or ads or Instagram or, uh, you know, um, content marketing or blah, 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 blah. And I said, listen, all of those are valid in their own right, but none of them are going to work if you don't have an offer that is compelling enough to get people to put their hand up and say, I'm interested, right, in, in what you're talking about, Okay. The channel is irrelevant and the medium doesn't really matter. It can be, 
you know, Twitter, we've picked up clients from Instagram posts. We've picked up clients from live events. We've picked up clients from SEO, from Facebook ads, from YouTube. We've picked up clients from the Agency Hour podcast, right? So the channel and the medium doesn't really matter. It's the offer that matters. So what I want to do is just very quickly talk about the offer and then talk about how content is the way that you communicate that offer to people who are not ready for a sales call. How do you use content to communicate your offer to people who are not ready yet to get on a call with you and become a client, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a deep dive into the ultimate content framework so that you can use this framework, by the way, to produce any piece of content. You can use it to produce a blog post. You can use it to produce a training video, a YouTube video, a webinar. Uh, you can use it to get up and talk at BNI. You can use it to produce an episode of a podcast, whatever. Can, can you use it for all those things at the same time? Yes, that's right. Asynchronously, I think. I'm not even really Ooh, sure what that word means. Word. But that's a good word. I'm yeah. not sure what it means. But, um, so, yes. Well, so what I like to do is I like to create video, which is what we're doing right now, and then the video becomes audio, which is the podcast, which for those of you who are listening to the podcast will know what I'm talking about there because you're listening to it in your earbuds, right? And then it also becomes a blog post because we write up the show notes for it. Then it also becomes an email because we send the email out to our list, right, to promote the blog post and get them to listen to the podcast. Then Max cuts a bunch of snippets up and they become Facebook videos, Facebook ads, Instagram stories, TikTokity wockity walks. I think apparently I'm not really sure what that is, but someone told me it's a thing. Um, I'm sure we're everywhere else that I don't know and don't care. Uh, a LinkedIn post can be a snippet from the show notes, right? So one, I mean, we sit here and flap our gums and talk shit for an hour and we've got enough content to sink the Titanic, right? From this one hour of conversation. The challenge I think that most people have with producing content is they look at a blank page or they look at a blank screen and they go, well, I, I have some ideas, but I'm not sure how to frame the conversation to make it interesting to the audience, right? And to get engagement and to get people to put their hand up and say, yes, I'm interested in that. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is that content creation framework. Um, Thomas Condit, apparently. From Santa Fe, New Mexico, he's moved from Virginia right around the corner from Johnny Flash. Ah, oh, there we go. And he's moved. He's now in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, thanks for sharing. So let's just talk a little bit. Oh, sorry. Before we get into this, I do want to uh, make a bit of an announcement. Had a huge win this week. I've signed a lease and picked up the keys for our brand new studio space that we I are moving that. into. I yes. love that little patio on the side there. It's Behind very the exciting. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm picturing like drinks after a Mavcon there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's yeah. very exciting. It's a very ex it's a it's a great space. Uh, it's very exciting. We're moving in there. We've got the keys. In fact, after this call, I'm going there today to hang out with Max and Bart, who is a buddy of mine, who's going to be coming in and doing some audio work in there, and the builders and the acoustic engineers to make sure that we can soundproof one of the rooms in there so that we can produce podcasts and get a really nice professional sound without disturbing the neighbours and without having external noise come in and uh, interrupt us. So uh, we will be, we should be starting to move the furniture and the builders will be in there for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to, we're making a serious investment. I can tell you it's you know, between you and me and everyone listening, it's going to be probably 25 to 30 grand investment in actually fitting out the building to make it suitable for what it is we are using it for. And then we're going to, so that'll be done by about the 23rd of, of April, I think. And then we'll move our furniture in after that. So I reckon by the sort of second week of May, we should be rocking and rolling and we'll be producing the agency hour from the new space, which is going to be very exciting indeed. So, uh, and Max is going to document the process through video. We're going to share a lot of videos in the group. So again, if you're listening to this and you want to see this space be transformed into a custom content creation studio, come and join the Digital Mavericks Facebook group and you can follow along the videos that Max is going to be making over the next couple of weeks as Lyndon, my builder, and his team put up new walls and new ceilings and soundproofing and all that kind of good stuff. Um, 
Right. So let's get into this. What we want to do is we want to talk about <clears throat> the very, very, very simple process of turning a stranger into a client, right? And there are a couple of pieces to this puzzle. The first thing I want to – oh, thank you, Siri. Uh, the f It's okay. I don't need your help right now. Um, the first thing uh, that I want to talk about is <clears throat> what is known as the four – truths or truths, however you say that word, the four truths, the four things that a stranger needs to believe in order for them to become a client. The first is that they need to believe that they have a problem that needs solving or that there is an opportunity they want to explore. The only reason people will become a client and pay you money. I don't care what it is you sell, by the way, if you sell Bluetooth speakers or if you sell keep cups or if you sell coaching or if you sell websites or SEO or drink bottles for four-year-olds that don't leak. I don't care what it is you sell. The only reason people will pay you money for a product or service is to either solve a problem or explore an opportunity. So, for example... SEO may not be an immediate problem that they're trying to solve. It might just be, hey, we've got this great website. We've got this great offer. We're doing really well. We just want to expand our audience and we want to rank better for our search terms and bring in more clients. No real problem right now, but we want to explore the opportunity of growing the business through organic traffic. And that's where SEO can be a great fit, right? So they need to believe they have a problem or that they need to solve or that they uh, have an opportunity worth exploring, right? So the next thing that they need to believe, and they need to believe that as a truth, They're like, oh, man, I've got this problem I need to solve. I need to hire a VA or I need to fix the website or I need to, we need to grow our e-commerce or we need whatever it is, right? They need to believe this needs to be consuming a little bit of their mindset, a little bit of their mental, their gray matter needs to be thinking about this thing. If they're not thinking about it, they're not going to be motivated to spend money on it or make an investment in it. So part of your job is to plant the seed or remind them, hey, remember that thing that you were thinking about once upon a time? Well, maybe now's a good time to do it. So that's the first thing that they need. you need them to believe. The second thing is they need to believe that the problem is worth solving now or that the opportunity is worth exploring now and not next year, right? So that's that will motivate them to take action now. So, hey, I realize I now have this problem. I'm thinking about it, and it's become apparent to me that we need to solve this problem now. We can't kick the can further down the road, okay? The third thing is that they need to believe that they can't do it themselves because if they think they can do it themselves, they're not going to hire anyone to do it. They're not going to invest any money in a solution right? And the fourth thing they need to believe is that you are the right person to help them. Okay. I hope you're making notes. If you're listening to this, or if you're watching along in the Facebook group, please write these down. This is also known as the four agreements, right? Once you're talking to a client, by the way, on a call or face-to-face -face or at a, an event or whatever, these are the four truths that become the four agreements, the four things that you, that you need them to agree with you on, right? Yes, we have a problem. Yes, it needs to be solved now. No, we can't do it on our own because we've tried. Yes, you are the right person to help us. Okay? So they're the four truths or the four agreements. Any questions about any of that so far? Crispy butter, Perry. No, I'm taking copious notes. Excellent. Um, so once – once now, now here's, here's where there are two ways – there are two – stages really of a relationship where you need to get these four agreements. One is you need them to start thinking about this stuff to get them on a call. Cause if they're not thinking about this stuff, if they don't, if they're not like, well, you know what, we have this website and uh, uh, we get a lot of traffic, but we're, it's not generating any revenue. This is a real example from one of my clients, right? Website doing really well from organic long tail SEO. Cause I've done a lot of work on it over the years, but generating hardly any revenue for them. 
most of their revenue comes from like over the phone. Their website's not actually generating automated revenue for them. And it was a huge opportunity. So I needed them to believe that the opportunity was to free up their time and make revenue while they sleep. I also needed them to believe that they should do this now and not kick it further down the road. And I needed them to believe that they can't do it themselves, which was easy because they'd been trying for years and they were stuck. And I needed them to believe that I was the right person to help them, which was also easy because they reached out to me. Guess why they reached out to me? Because they'd been following my content for years. And they're not an agency, but they'd been following my... That was like foreshadowing right there. That was like what? Foreshadowing. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And and they'd they'd been following the content I'd been putting out for agencies. And they'd been looking at that content going, but hang on, this is applicable to our business as well. So it was a fairly easy sale because they already believed those things and they agreed those things, right? So the first stage that you need someone to be thinking about this stuff is when they're a prospect, right? When they are kind of hanging around on the edges and they might be thinking about doing something. The second phase of the relationship where you need to believe them is during a sales call, during a meeting or a call where you are going to present your offer to them, okay? So what we want to talk about, particularly on this call, is how do you use content and a content framework to produce one piece of content that moves them from prospect to, shit, we need to start taking action on this now, and how do you get those four agreements baked into your content to organically move them through the process so that they want to have a conversation with you. Because I promise you, if people reach out to you and want to have a conversation with you, you're like eight and a half times more likely to close them into a client than if you interrupt them and and get in front of them and start to try and convince them that they should become a client. You want them coming to you. And the way that you do that is through content, right? So how do you use content to present your offer and get those four agreements? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're about to dive into for the rest of this episode of the Agency Hour. Are we excited? Yes. I think, I think, uh, I think it's the common thing that we focus on when we, most of us, when we do content, we focus on what maybe what the problem is. Uh-huh. We don't focus on any of the other stuff, the other four agreements. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we talk about you know, getting traffic or whatever, converting, you know, getting leads, getting whatever, but we don't talk about all of it together and how it all ties together. And I think, I think what a lot of us do sometimes is we focus on the solution. We try and educate and be helpful by kind of presenting a solution, right? And what we end up doing, I think, is teaching too much to try Mm -hmm. and show off our technical expertise or our marketing Mm. expertise, which is a perfectly normal, natural thing to do because it's like, well, if I show them how much I know, then they will come and hire me because it's clear that I know what I'm talking about, right? But I think the piece that's – so, and and that's content, but what's missing is the context, Mm. right? So the content is like, you know, I was watching a, uh, and, and, you know, I know Paul Warren, uh, watches, uh, our show here and is a big fan and is in the group and he has his own podcast, the insight sessions that he runs with, uh, Chris McLean, I think it is. They did a podcast episode, uh, the other day about H1 tags on pages. Right. And I was, I was watching, I was going, well, this is interesting and I, I understand it and I know it and it's useful, but, uh, and not to, you know, criticize Paul and what they're doing, because I think they're doing a great job. But I think, I think what's missing in most of this kind of content is the context as to why this matters and why you should be paying attention to it now. So the, the simple framework, because it's, it's not that people don't care about the content unless they have a reason to care about why it matters. Right. So I think it was, Zig Ziglar that said, or someone said, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. If you can pre-frame, if you can wrap your content up in some context that lets your audience know that you understand the negative or positive impact on their business of getting this right or getting it wrong. So for example, you know, SEO, how you've got this e-commerce store, if you don't get traffic, 
you're going to have a whole bunch of stock that just sits there and doesn't move and you're hot, you're warehousing it and you're paying it. You've got staff costs, right? You need that stock to move. The way to get your stock to move is to get traffic through your online store. So straight away, they're like, oh, wow, you understand a little bit about the e-commerce business. You know that I've got all this stock in the warehouse and I mm-hmm. need it to move and that e-commerce is tight margins and it's got to be volume and whatever, right? So all of a sudden, they understand that you care about their problem. Now they're way more likely to pay attention to what it is you're saying rather than if you just dive straight in and go, let's help you get you know more organic traffic to your e-commerce store because they're like, well, that's boring. Who cares? Like, why does it matter? Why, why should I pay attention to this, right? So here's – I'm going to just walk you through and, again, make some notes. I haven't prepared any slides or anything because it's a podcast, so slides wouldn't make sense. But I'm going to walk you through the framework – The very first thing that I like to do with any piece of content is what I call, and I need to give a huge shout out to a man named Brendan Bouchard, who taught me his content creation framework 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I took one of his courses, which was the best $2,000 I ever spent. It's called Total Product Blueprint, and it was an amazing product. And this business wouldn't be here right now. In fact, I wouldn't have just signed a lease on a new studio space if it wasn't for Brendan Bouchard's teaching and mentoring over the years. So I can't speak highly enough of that man. Very animated and very excited character, a little bit goofy at times, but uh, knows his shit and he's a great teacher. Anyway, he calls this the problem. Sorry, he calls this the promise, right? Now, this is an augmentation. This is I've taken his framework and added to it over the years, but I start off with the way that he starts off, which is the promise. And the promise simply states why someone should pay attention to the content you're about to deliver them, right? So let's get an example here, right? Let's use an example. In fact, someone, I can use examples from our world, but I'd rather use an example from someone, one of the the viewers here, right? So if you're watching this, let me know if you've got an example of a piece of content that you want to produce that you think might be helpful, let us know in the comments, and I will attempt to live here with no rehearsal and no practice. I will attempt to wrap your piece of content in the context of this framework to make it more compelling. Okay. Sure. Let me know. Sure being without a net. Let's go, guys. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, building the runway as the plane takes off. So uh, the so the promise. So if you imagine you're giving away a free piece of content, whether it's a video on YouTube, a webinar, uh, you know, whatever it is, Jaden Navarrete, thank you very much. The anatomy of a good home builder website. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Sorry, Matt Stanley. Jaden beat you to the punch. The anatomy of a good home builder website. So home builders, uh, we call them builders in Australia too. The anatomy of a good home builder website. Great. I don't need to know what the anatomy is, right? I don't need to know what the anatomy is, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the context. So the context, the very first piece of any sort of piece of content is the promise, okay? And the promise simply states why you should pay attention to this piece of content for the next however long it's going to take them to consume it. So, you know, people land on a blog post and a lot of blogs these days have that thing at the top that says reading time, you know, three minutes and 17 seconds and people look at it and go, oh, I haven't got three minutes and 17 seconds to read something. Uh, And they bounce. So the very first thing that you say, I'm not suggesting that you use the headline, the promise, but this is the point of the very first sentence or two is why they should pay attention to this blog post or this infographic or this video or this podcast episode or whatever it is, right? Why should they pay attention? Even though it's a free piece of content, you're asking them to invest some time to consume the content. So why should they pay attention? And typically, the questions that I ans- that I try and answer in that sort of opening paragraph is how will their, what will change as a result of them reading this piece of content or what could potentially change as a result of them consuming this content, right? Why should they pay attention? And what potentially could the negative impact be if they don't pay attention? So, you know, Ignore this at your own peril is the classic direct response marketing headline, right? But that's the question you, you're trying to answer. Like if you ignore this, this is what could happen. So let's talk about the anatomy of a good home builder website. And I don't know what the anatomy is, so I'm going to make it up. Uh, the promise 
uh, would be, and it's funny because I'm talking to Peter Wright at the moment, who builds beautiful websites for home builders here mm-hmm. in Australia. He does good work. And the, one of the big problems that, that, that home builders have is that they come to Peter and say, look, we do amazing work, but we're not, our online presence doesn't reflect how good we are, right? So if I was producing a blog post around the anatomy of a good home builder website, I might start off by saying something like, chances are you're doing building beautiful homes and doing great work for your clients, but people who don't know you and aren't referred to you don't know the beautiful work that you're doing. And so having a great website can help you communicate to perfect strangers the beautiful work that you're doing while you're asleep because a website is open for business 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The problem is if you don't get the anatomy of your website right from the start, search engines probably won't pick it up and won't start recommending it. And then when people do visit it, they won't take the action that you want them to take. So you get to invest a lot of time into this website and it's not actually going to move the needle for you or bring in new clients. Okay, that's it. So in this article, we're going to walk you through the anatomy of the ultimate website for home builders. Now, if I'm a home builder, I'm paying attention. I'm like, okay, you've made your case. It's not a sales pitch. You've made your case as to why I should pay attention to this. Okay. That there is the promise of this piece of content. The next thing that I pivot into straight away is the problem. Okay. And Look at that. Max is all over it. I mean, Max just knows this stuff so well. He had that little that little lower third pop up there. The minute I said it, he knew exactly what I was – and by the way, I'm not communicating with him in back channels in Slack here, and he doesn't know what I'm about to say next. He's just been around long enough that he, he knows the framework. So the problem in this case, right, the problem, what you want to do here is – so the first is the promise. The second – the first is the promise. The second is the problem. And what you want to do in the problem is you want to really twist the knife a little bit and remind them of the problem that they currently have, right? Don't remind, don't, in, so in this case, the anatomy of a good home builder website, I wouldn't be talking about the website. I wouldn't be talking about anything technical. I'd be talking about the actual problem the home builder is currently experiencing. And this is where you need to know your audience really well. And by the way, if you don't know the answer to these questions, get on the phone with existing clients or people who are in your network that you trust and have a good relationship with and that you can be vulnerable with and say, hey, I'm doing some market research so that I can get better at what I do and I want to know what problems do you currently face in the business that you think a website might be able to help you with. And in this case, I would hazard a guess because I've been doing this for 150 years, I would probably hazard a guess that the problem that a home builder has and why they're thinking about building a website is because all of their business comes from referrals and word of mouth and that they're looking to expand those channels and get in front of more strangers and get in front of a wider audience. And that's why they're thinking of building a website. So in this case, you've outlined the promise of this piece of content. And then you would say to the home builder, Jaden, I hope you're making notes. Then you would say to the home builder, you know, the problem is, If you don't have a website or you have a website that's built with the wrong anatomy, you're going to be relying on referrals and word of mouth for the rest of your miserable life in your home building business, which is great until it's not. And in our experience, referrals and word of mouth always dry up at some point. They always do. And every business owner knows it. They're just kicking the can further down the road. They're in denial about it. They know they have to fix it at some point. But while the referrals are coming in, They just pretend it's not a problem until the referrals stop and then they panic. So what we suggest is that you get your website built right so that you can start to bring in more prospects from other channels so that when your referrals do dry up, you've got some safety and some security there because you're not just relying on the one channel of new business. Oh, (laughs) I'm going to give myself a round of applause for that. Hey, man's a genius. Not bad bad for just kind of. Not bad for off the cuff. eh? Yeah. Um, so that's the promise and the problem. Now here's the secret weapon. And again, I need to give a big shout out to Brennan Bouchard because when he taught me this, it blew my mind and it's so simple, but so powerful. So you've, you've made, by the way, you're at like 
five or six sentences now into the piece of content, right? So we're not boring the pants off them. This is like 70% of this blog post is actually going to be the thing that you teach them. What we're doing here is just wrapping it up in some context. So we've told them why they should pay attention. We've outlined the problem. Now what you do is what is called myth busting, also known as old school versus new school, right? And this is a this is this is what really positions you as the expert. So in this case, what I would do is say, um, now you might be thinking that you can just throw up a website on Wix or Squarespace and do it yourself. And you know what? You can. And that might seem odd because you're on my blog post and you might realize that we build websites for home builders. And here I am telling you that you can do it yourself. Well, the truth is you can. But if you don't understand the anatomy of a good home builder website, you're going to build the wrong website, which is then going to be harder to fix in the long run. Just like building a home. You want to make sure you have the bathroom and the plumbing in the right place before we put the bricks up. Because once the bricks are up, it's harder to move the pipes. So you might just be thinking you can do it on Wix. That's the that's the myth that we're trying to bust. And what we're saying is you can, but you can't just throw up one of their templates and hope for the best. You need to follow the anatomy of a good home builder website. So what that does straight away is it positions you as someone with deep knowledge of the topic and it shifts their thinking. Oh man, I thought I could just throw up a template on Wix and this is going to be a little more complex than that. Right? So they're like, oh, okay, this isn't going to be as easy as I thought. So it positions you as the expert and it shifts their thinking. Okay. So we've got the promise. We've got the problem. We've got myth busting. The next thing you do, and this should take about a one sixth of a nanosecond is you tell them your story. It's called my story which is basically why you should listen to me, right? So you say, hey, just before we dive in, my name's Jaden. I build websites for home builders. And over the last 13 years, we've built 8,000 websites and we've helped 7,468 home builders double their revenue. Um, in fact, go here and check out our testimonials page if you don't believe me. But enough about me. Let's dive in to the anatomy of a good home builder website. Right? So that my story is just like, well, who the hell are you and why should I listen to you? Whatever social proof or whatever credibility you can give them, one testimonial or one little bit of social proof or one result or one tiny mention of a case study or something, one transformation. Right? We're in the business of selling change, ladies and gentlemen. So whatever you can do to communicate how you have helped someone experience positive change in their situation, that's what you put in my story, your experience, how long you've been doing it and the results that you get. And it doesn't have to be like, keep it super, super short because nobody cares at this stage about you or how good you are. What they care about is what's in it for me. So then what we do is go straight into the teaching points. So, uh, and, and so the next headline is the teaching points, which I'll come back to in a second, because what I want to do now is just want to recap and, th and think about what we've done with the four agreements so far right? Let's remind ourselves, Crispy Butter was making some notes. What are the four agreements, my friend? The four agreements are that we have a problem, that it needs to be solved now, mm -hmm. that they cannot do it themselves because they probably already tried, mm -hmm. and that Troy Dean is the person, or Jaden Neverett is the person to help them solve that problem. Preferably if they think Troy Dean is the person that can help them solve that problem, that would be, if you can all produce content that tells them that Troy Dean is the person that can help them solve that problem, that would be much appreciated. I promise I'll funnel the leads back to you. Um, right. So I think what we've done is I think we've achieved the first agreement. At this point, we've outlined the promise of the content. We've told them and we've kind of twisted the knife on the problem. We've busted a myth. I think by now we have helped them understand that yes, they have a problem that needs solving or there's an opportunity here that they should explore. I think in the, in the problem section, you could sprinkle some urgency in there. For example, you could say, you know, um, Google has updated their algorithm four times in the last 12 months. And what we know is that if 
that our anatomy of a good home builder website is algorithmic proof. It doesn't matter what they do with the algorithm because the, this anatomy will work regardless of how often they change the algorithm. So that's a little bit of timing, like let's get it right now, okay? We've also, I think we've we've uh, highlighted why they maybe think they can do it themselves, but it's going to be a little more complex than they think. So they're, now they're starting to doubt whether or not they can do it themselves. Most people are consuming your content in the hope that they'll learn enough that they can do it themselves and not have to yes. spend money. Yes. That's why people consume content, right? So at this stage, we've probably got them where they know they've got a problem. They know it needs to be fixed. They know it needs to be fixed now. And they kind of realize that it's probably going to be harder than they think to do it themselves. They still don't know that you're the right person, but this is where your teaching points will, and what we do after the teaching points will tell them that you are the right person. So the next phase is the teaching points. And the teaching points, I used to say one to three teaching points, right? Now I say one. What you want to do is you want to teach them one thing in painstaking detail, right? One thing in painstaking detail that will help them see some progress and, 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 and help them have an aha moment not confuse the shit out of them with scientific techno babble, but help them enough that they can see the light at the end of the tunnel and go, wow, this is amazing, super helpful. You clearly know what you're talking about. I could do this one thing myself, and I'll give you an example in a moment. I could do this one thing myself, but I just don't know if I want to spend the time to do this. I feel like you might be able to do it quicker and more efficiently for me. Let me give you an example. Home builder website, the anatomy of a good home builder website. I'm going to make something up here because I don't know what Jaden's anatomy is, but I would say one of the things that you definitely want to include. So what you could do is you could teach the anatomy of a good home builder website is one thing. You're teaching them one thing, right? You're teaching them the pages that they need to have on the website. That could be the anatomy. Here is the perfect site map for a home builder website. You want to have a home page. You want to have an about page. You want to have your portfolio gallery page. You want to have your testimonials page. You want to have a team page to show who the, who the team are. Right? That's you, you can teach that in detail and talk about why each page is important. What you're not going to do in this case is you're not going to teach them how to structure each page. You're going to teach them how to structure the site, homepage, about page, services, gallery, team, contact, testimonials, right? Here's how it all hangs together. Here's a picture of the site map. Here's how the pages work together. Contact page goes to an email, right? Blah, blah, blah. You're not going to teach them the detail of each page. You're just going to teach them the one thing. Now, if I was teaching them one thing, I would say something like, uh, one of the most important things you need to have on a website is social proof. And one of the easiest ways to get social proof is to connect your Google reviews from your Google My Business listing to your website so that when people give you a five-star review on your Google My Business listing, it appears on your website. Let me show you how to do that. And I would show them whatever plugin or whatever bit of code you need, I would do a screen share and show them exactly how to set up their Google My Business reviews on their website so that when someone leaves them a review, it appears on their website. In fact, I would probably do that with a client site, go and give them a review and see it magically appear on the client's website. But look at that, it's magic. They left me a review on Google reviews and here it appears on the client's website. I'm a magician. What I wouldn't tell them is how to get more Google reviews. Right. And I'll tell you why in a moment. I'll tell you why in a moment. But I would solve, I would help them and I would also tell them why Google reviews are so important. Social proof is going to add credibility. It's going to get people to take more action it proves trust, all that kind of stuff, right? I would make the case as to why Google reviews are important. Teach them how to do it. So the teaching point, as I said, I used to say one to three teaching points. I now say one. Go deep because and you go teach really one deep. thing. Yeah. Go yeah. really deep, man. Blow them away with how much you know about this one thing. And then straight after that, I do uh, what's called rookie mistakes and power tips, otherwise known as do's and don'ts. Rookie mistakes is, hey, if you've never done this before, this is the most common mistake people make 
when they do this for the first time, right? Uh, they do this and it breaks because of this. So here's how to fix that. So, you, you know, follow along what I did, but I'm just warning you, most common mistake you're going to make is this. Don't do that. Do this instead. Now, for those of you who might already understand this and want a little bit more of an advanced tip, uh, what I'm going to show you in another blog post that I'll publish next week or next month is how to ramp up the number of Google reviews you're getting so that once this widget is on your website, you can automatically just be adding Google reviews to your website while you sleep. And I'll show you how to automate the whole process of getting Google reviews from your existing clients and from new clients in the future. You don't teach them how to do that in this piece of content because remember, this piece of content is about one thing. But what I've done there is I've future broadcasted, I've forward announced, right, that I'm going to make another piece of content about this thing for the people who want more. But what I've also done is I've said to everyone in that piece of content, this is not the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. yep. Getting the Google review widget to display on your website is one thing. But how do you get more Google reviews? Right. And then how do you tie that Google review widget and put it in the right place to get people to click the button to get on a call? There's a whole bunch of other things that we need to consider that I haven't got time to go into in this piece of content. So every piece of content solves one problem but highlights a bunch of new problems that they haven't even thought about yet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is when they say, ah, you are clearly the person to help me with this. That's the fourth agreement. That rookie tips, rookie mistakes and power tips is the four, straight after the teaching points. That's how you get that fourth agreement in content. Remember, we haven't spoken to these people yet. They're reading a blog post on Medium or they're watching a video on YouTube or they're listening to a podcast, right? We get those four agreements without actually interacting with the individual. We're doing it through content, which is leveraged marketing you produce the piece of content once and people read it while you're asleep, right? So we're getting that fourth agreement through that, the rookie mistakes and the power tips. And then directly after the rookie mistakes and the power tips, we do next steps. And guess what next steps is? Next steps is the call to action. Call to next action, steps yeah is where we say, hey, I know I've given you a lot of information right now and you probably feel like you're drinking from the fire hose. If you want a hand doing this, just get in touch. We'll jump on a very quick call and see if we're a good fit to work together. And if we are, I'll let you know how that works and how much it costs and how long it takes. And if we're not, totally fine. We'll part ways as friends. Hopefully you've learned something in this video or this blog post and it's helpful. Share it with anyone you think might benefit from it. And I'll see you on the flip side. Have a great day. Ciao. Bye for now. Over and out. Auf Wiedersehen. Right? I'm out of here. Done. So let's recap. The promise of the content. Yeah. The problem that they are currently experiencing. Myth busting. Right? Old school versus new school thinking. Your story. Very, very quickly. Your story. Don't bore them. Don't be that guy at the party that just talks about yourself all night. Right? Very boring. The teaching point. Right? One part of the solution in detail, rookie mistakes and power tips, and then next steps. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your ultimate content framework. Now, let me just give you a rookie mistake that most people make when they start producing content. Yeah, you did that. You did that. <laughs> oh, he's just got to give myself another round of applause. Um, most people overteach. Most people teach too much. And what happens is someone starts reading your content and they get into it and then they go, oh, fuck, I haven't got time for this. It's too hard. I have to think. I don't want to think. If I have to think, I'm out, right? So don't overteach. Teach one thing in detail, but keep it simple. Don't overteach. Don't confuse them. Just keep it high level, okay? Now, the power tip is what I like to do, for those of you who are kind of doing this and want to take it to the next level, is I like to produce video, as we said at the start of this episode, and we take that video and cut it up into multiple different types of content and multiple breadcrumbs that all lead back to 
the one post. So this will end up, this episode of the Agency Hour will end up on our blog as a blog post. It'll be the show notes of the Agency Hour and it will be a blog post which is indexable by Google and it will help us come up in search and all that kind of good stuff. It's also a video in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group, which I think will also end up on YouTube. If um, Max is nodding to me in the green room, right, we'll end up on YouTube. The audio is a podcast, so we now have video, audio, blog post. Snippets of this video will end up on Facebook in our group and our page and probably as an ad. Snippets of it will end up in Instagram. We'll take out little quotes and turn them into tweetables and posts in the on social media, right? So one video becomes multiple breadcrumbs. We call it the content shredder. We put it through the content shredder, end up with multiple pieces of content that all lead back to the blog post. Okay, that's how you leverage the one piece of content that you've made and sprinkle it around because some people hate watching video, some people hate reading, right? So you want to make sure that you give people the content in the format that they want it in. So I know that there's a lot here to take in and you probably feel like you're drinking from the fire hose right now. So if you'd like some help with your content strategy in your agency, there's a couple of things you can do. You can go to our website and you can buy the content strategy blueprint course, or you can get on a call with our team and see if we can help you build out a content strategy for your agency and uh, help you take your agency to the next level. See what I did there? There we go. That, was, the your, next, that was your next that's, step called action. Yeah, that's, that's, there we go. Good. Done. Good. I'm out. Auf Wiedersehen. Bye for now. <laughs> Ciao, baby. So that's it. That's the – now – We've got the four agreements. Uh, we've got a piece of content. The only thing I want to mention now is that you want to make sure that this one piece of content ties in with what it is you are offering. And let me just throw a spanner in the works and say this. If you are offering websites or SEO or pay-per-click ad management or any other stupid, boring technical term that sounds like a commodity, then you will be most likely hit a glass ceiling because you can only charge what the market wants to pay for those commodities. So what you want to do is try and position your offer in a way that helps your target audience solve their actual problem, not just buying websites or SEO. So Jaden, if I was selling websites to home builders, I would ban myself from using the word website. Yes. Absolutely. Right. I would call it, well, I said this to Peter the other day, who's here in Australia, so he's not going to be your competition. I said to Peter, I would probably call it something like their digital portfolio or their online portfolio or mm. their whatever, like digital brochure or whatever. I just don't call it a website because the minute you say website, the global average for a small business website is $3,500, right? So the minute you say website to a small business owner, in their mind, they're like, well, this should not cost me any more than $3,500. And you're charging me, what, 12 grand? That doesn't make sense. Or you want two grand a month for a 12-month commitment? That doesn't make sense. So don't use the word website. Make sure your offer solves their problem and is compelling to them and doesn't talk about the commodities that are the deliverables. Right. It's pretty good. That's pretty good. Almost, pretty good. Feels like a feels like I bought minutes. one from the... Yeah, it feels like I bought one from the shop. Um, now, I do, I do. Any questions? Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Jaden doesn't have any questions because he's actually writing his blog post from everything that you just said. He's just filling in a few gaps Excellent. and he's got, his, got himself a blog post. So, by the way, uh, you can turn these blog posts into emails, right? You can turn them into a series sure, of emails. Sure. You can so turn them into an email you know. course. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, Peter Wright is oh, here. there you go, Peter Wright. There we go, <laughs> dude. Excellent, love it. Peter's taking massive action, by the way. He's in Sales Accelerator. I love people who take massive action, it's just so rewarding. Speaking of which, I do want to share. I'm not going to tell you people's names because I respect the privacy of our customers, but I do want to share some wins that oh, we have had recently. Uh, across a couple of our different programs. I'm going to talk we about have, Mavericks we Club. Have a, we have a Mavericks Club uh, ring the bell channel in our Slack, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's just on fire lately. On fire. Absolutely on fire. So I'm reading off it here now, right? I'm not going to tell you people's names because I respect their privacy. Uh, I'm reading here, right? Uh, 
I achieved 30 calls in 30 days. Amazing. Actually, 30, 32 calls 32. in 30 days. My offer has shifted and I needed to validate it. So this particular Maverick has shifted her offer a little bit and needed to validate it. So she did 32 outbound calls in 30 days. I positioned the call as market research. Hey, if you give me 30 minutes to ask questions, I'll give you 30 minutes to ask questions about your online business. No sales pitch, I promise. Isn't that great? I'm going to ask you questions for 30 minutes, do some market research, and then you can pick my brain for 30 minutes, and I promise not to sell you anything. Love it. Uh, she managed to get some work from but it. She got work way. out of it, right? Exactly. <laughs> right? But more importantly, I learned some things about where my positioning needs to be rephrased. It is both exhilarating and exhausting to talk to so many people I don't know, but it's well worth it. Massive action. Uh, another Maverick here. Uh, Woohoo! I asked for the sale and I got it, plus a bonus one. The system works. Uh, this is my favorite here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Troy Dean, for the help in closing a $6,000 a month retainer for one of our biggest clients. It's signed off for six months for now. Do the math. Six months contract at $6,000 a month retainer. It's uh, I helped this particular Maverick package this offer up and present it. I, I didn't help her present it. I coached her through how to package it and present it. It was presented as fractional digital strategist, right? Uh, the retainer includes basically a bunch of meetings with our Mavericks Club member and her client. No design, no development or project deliverables at all. No deliverables, nothing. Just no deliverables. Pick my brain. And pay me six thousand dollars a month. Correct. Pay me thirty six thousand dollars. Yep. And and I'll think brain. for you. And I'll think for you and tell you right. what to do. <laughs> right. Right. Thirty six grand, and I will think for you and use my experience and tell you what you should do next. Right. Which may end up turning into more work for her. Of course it will, because yeah. this client yeah. this client's already on a, on a retainer for deliverables, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it will definitely it will definitely turn into more consulting. Here's what I know to be true is that people will pay you more to think for them than they will pay you to move their furniture. Think about it. How much do removalists charge and how much do lawyers charge? Lawyers charge more than removalists and right. lawyers don't move fridges. Lawyers think right. and we pay them way more than we pay laborers. People will pay you more to think for them than to do anything. Fractional digital strategist. So if you do if you do marketing, if you just do marketing for clients, right, you could position yourself as a fractional marketing chief marketing officer. We have a fractional chief marketing officer who works for us, Tisu. He's based in Canada. He's like super young. He's a gun. He's an absolute ninja. And he thinks for me. Yeah. He designs our marketing campaigns, but he only works for us a fraction of the time because he's got a bunch of other clients. So he's a fraction and we pay him a fraction of what it would cost us if we hired a full-time chief marketing officer, right? So it works for everyone. Uh, this particular Maverick was doing more than marketing. She's basically kind of doing digital transformation, digital change. Like she's basically trying to help them upgrade their systems, right? So I told her, well, really, you're a digital strategist. It's not just marketing. She's looking at kind of internal processes and stuff as well. So she positioned it as fractional digital strategist. Amazing, huge win. One more I want to share with you here. Uh, actually, there's two. One more I want to share with you here. And again, I'm not giving people's names because I respect our clients' privacy. Uh, one of our Mavericks... Sold the biggest project I've ever sold, $28,700 for a course creator. Building a website for a course creator, $28,700. A small, a small website for twelve grand, which will be based on our productized website. Paul Warren, I hope you're listening. Productized website. And a $4,000 sales page design and copywriting Check this out. $4,000 for sales page design and copywriting coaching. No development. Just coaching them through the copy coaching them and designing. The yeah. Coaching so them through the copy. Basically giving them your fam framework that you just. <laughs> Correct. That's right. Exactly. For an influencer uh, who's a, a coach and a course creator, right? 
Thanks to Sales Accelerator. Now, this particular client is in Mavericks Club, but of course gets access to Sales Accelerator mm. as a Maverick because they basically, if you're a Maverick, you can come and hang out in my kitchen and have dinner with me. You get access to everything. Thanks, not quite. Thanks to Sales Accelerator for helping me up my sales game and put in less work to get the sale. When this person joined Mavericks, they were doing about, on average, five unpaid discovery calls before they closed a deal. Ooh. Now putting in less work to get the sale. Now also, this client invoiced forty k forty thousand dollars last month, forty thousand dollars for the month of March, and fired four thousand dollars worth of recurring revenue clients who weren't a good fit and took up too much time and said no to a couple of projects that weren't in our niche to make sure I'm focused on projects that I can create repeatable processes for. Ah. Oh. Ding, 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 ding. Like, it just does not get any better than that. And also just hired a new developer thanks to Team Accelerator. Again, gets access to Team Accelerator because he's in Mavericks and uh, pretty sure this new developer is going to be a superstar. I trusted the process trusted the Mavericks Club team, and trusted my gut. On fire. Um, final uh, win here. And this is, sh I'm shamelessly sharing the successes that we have because, frankly, I don't think we do this enough. I don't think we spend enough time championing and celebrating the wins that our clients have and also letting everyone else know that uh, what we do here works. We've sold our highest website yet at seven and a half grand for a new client, twenty five hundred a month over three months. Woohoo! Fantastic. So these are the kind of results we get in the Ring the Bell channel here in Mavericks Club. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I could go through in Sales Accelerator, but I'm not going to because we're out of time. But I just wanted to uh, share uh, that six, those success stories with you all and let you know that if you are serious about growing your agency, like if you're serious about growing your agency, getting off the tools building a profitable business that operates ultimately without you so that you can have a baby and take some time off for parental leave and not run out of money or go on a holiday to the States for four weeks and come home and not run out of money. Like what happened to one of my photographer friends who took his wife to the States for uh, four weeks and spent about 10 grand on the holiday and lost 15 grand in revenue because he wasn't on the shutter taking photos and he has no recurring mm -hmm. revenue and no team. And he's like, what do I do? I'm like, dude, You've been following my shit for five years and you've done nothing. Hire people and put your prices up, right? Always be selling, always be recruiting. Never stop selling, never stop recruiting. If you are serious about growing your agency, get on a call with one of our team and we'll see if we can help you. We're not going to pitch you because, frankly, most people that we talk to are not right for us. Yeah. Right? So chances are we're going to get on a call and go, look, you know, we probably can't help you go away and do this, fix that, go away and do that, fix this, and then come back and have another conversation. So it's not a sales pitch. We just want to see if we can actually help you. If we can, we'll point you in the right direction, let you know what that looks like. If we can't, we'll part ways as friends. We are good either way. All right. Uh, this has been fun. It has. Again. You're going to go it practice is. some bass? It was good. Some uh, bass, no, I'm going to go have dinner. <laughs> have dinner. 12 bar blues in G, man. I'll, I'll put a backing track together for you. Huh? All right. There you go. All right. Thanks. thanks for hanging out again. Uh, again, subscribe, follow us on Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. It's called the Agency Hour, brought to you by Agency Mavericks. And if you're not already in the group, join the agency, uh, join the Digital Mavericks group on Facebook and be a part of the conversation. Thanks again, Crispy Butter, for hanging out. It's been right. fun. I will see you again see you next, next week on the yeah. Agency Hour. Take care, guys.